as good as mine. Is it chapter four? Three? Three. Three. Three is like four, but not quite there yet. That's right. So uh, chapter three, here. I'm going to go with bonding. It feels like a good place to be doing bonding in this chapter. So uh, last time uh, before the exam that everybody loved, uh, we uh, did chapter three here, which was chemical bonding. And we really talked about Lewis structures uh, and how to properly draw Lewis structures. And remember that when you do draw Lewis structures, really you want to kind of follow a uh, few rules to make sure that you get a pretty good drawing. And those rules pretty much are the one of the main one is to figure out the number of valence electrons there are. And that's the total number of valence electrons um, that there is in an atom or in a structure there of a molecule. And that number is really important because when you draw your picture, you got to hit exactly on that number. You can't have any more, or any less. You want to do a, a single bond from the center atom to each of the outside atoms. Remember, we typically don't want a double bond or triple bond sort of right out of the box or anything like that. Uh, we kind of want to save it for any type of situation. That's a problem. Once you do that, each uh, single bond represents two electrons. So whatever electrons you got left are going to go on the outside atoms first in pairs. Uh, so then we fill out the outside with pairs of electrons, then to the center atom, also pairs of electrons if you have some left over. Remember also that to help you decide what should go in the center, uh, it is the least electronegative atom is typically the one that occupies the center position. Uh, obviously, fluorine, which is the most electronegative atom, will not be in the center. And obviously, hydrogen that can only have two electrons should never find itself in the center either. Uh, at that point, if you have distributed all your electrons and everybody has eight except for hydrogen that has two, uh, then you should have a good Lewis structure at that point. Uh, if the octet rule is not met, then that's really where you want to kind of double bond our triple bond to fix it. And remember that when we do make a double bond or a triple bond, we are actually uh, taking a pair of electrons in to make that double bond. So we do not end up with uh, too many bonds to a particular atom. And that also goes for your triple bond as well. We bring some electrons in to do that as well. Um, and at that point, it really should be fixed. So hopefully by the time we get to a triple bond, um, again, if there happens to be a situation where uh, you could double bond on a couple places and you still have a methoctet rule after the first double bond, you probably want to double bond the next thing before you go to a triple bond um, and sort of finish it out that way. Uh, we talked about the idea as well, I think, at the end of formal charge and uh, formal charge is something that we can calculate from a Lewis structure of basically the charge that each of the sort of atoms will basically have in that bonding situation where they're sharing electrons. And to calculate the formal charge, uh, you take the number of valence electrons in the free atom, you subtract it from the number of non-bonding electrons, minus one half the number of bonding electrons. And you can calculate the formal charge uh, on every element in a particular uh, compound that you draw. And we can actually use formal charge. Another sort of aspect of formal charge is to use it to help us decide uh, between different sort of Lewis structures to see maybe which one would be a better Lewis structure versus another one uh, that might be a, a worse Lewis structure. Um, the ideal sort of situation is to sort of uh, minimize formal charge. So to get everybody down to zeros or as close to zeros as possible, is sort of the ideal situation. Uh, if you can't do that and you're sort of trying to decide between two equivalent sort of Lewis structures, the one where uh, the more negative formal charge ends up on the more electronegative atom is probably the one that's going to be favored. And really large formal charges um, you know, plus twos, plus threes, plus fours, or whatever, are usually not the best sort of structures. So we could oftentimes use formal charge to help uh, guide us to maybe a better structure versus another. Any questions on any of that there? So I think we laid up here, and we did not do this example, correct? 
So here is uh, formaldehyde, and here's two possible uh, structures for formaldehyde, and it's really the difference here is obviously the way it's kind of connected. And uh, so why don't you calculate the formal charges on all these atoms in each structure, and then use that to help you decide which one would be the better structure in this case. Okay, let's take a look. Uh, we'll start with the one on the left here. So we got a single bonded hydrogen that looks like this. So to calculate the formal charge, hydrogen has one valence electron. In this case, there is no non-bonding electrons. I guess maybe I should use the, the separated. Uh, minus one half of our bonding, which is two, which gives us zero. So in this case, this hydrogen and this hydrogen will come out the same because uh, it's basically the same bond. If we look at the carbon here, we got that kind of happening. So for carbon, uh, we got um, four minus two, which would be our non-bonding electrons, minus one half of six, two for each of the lines that are there. That gives us uh, a lot of math there. That's four minus two is two uh, minus uh, half of three, six, which is three. And go with a negative one on that deal. There. Now we also have an oxygen that's kind of double bonded and a single bond on the back end here. Uh, so oxygen, again, is 6 uh, minus 2, which is our non-bonding electrons, minus 1 half of 6 in this case. And that's going to give us 6 minus 2, which is 4, uh, minus 3, which is plus 1. So this is sort of the uh, formal charge in this particular molecule. Any questions on how to calculate that? <clears throat> we'll do it for our guy on the right here. We got our hydrogen, which again will be one minus zero minus one half of two, which is zero. So that's a zero, that's a zero. We have our carbon in the middle that kind of looks like this. So that's gonna be four minus zero minus one half of eight, and that's gonna be zero. And we have our double bonded oxygen, which looks like so. It's going to be six minus four, as we have four non-bonding electrons, minus one half of four, which are also in there. And that gives us uh, six minus four, which is two, minus a half of four, which is two, which is zero in this case. Based on formal charge, the better structure is the one here on the right, as it definitely has minimized formal charge down to zeros. One on the left, not bad in terms of formal charges, but also not so great because when we look at, say, carbon and oxygen, between those two, the more electronegative atom is oxygen further to the right. And it actually has the more positive formal charge in that arrangement, which also is not so great in terms of that. You would want it on the more negative formal charge on the more electronegative atom. Question on that. Let's try one more. Say... Uh, Let's say I want to draw carbon dioxide like this because I'm a fan of a triple bond, something like this. And I want to draw carbon dioxide like this because I like double bonds as well. All right, calculate the uh, formal charge in each of those and pick which one is the better structure. Okay, let's take a look. We'll start with the uh, top one up here. Uh, so uh, we have our single bonded oxygen on that one, and that would give us six minus uh, six minus one half of two, as we have two, four, and six electrons, and obviously our two electrons here for our bonding, and that's going to be six minus six, which is uh, zero, minus a half of two, which is one, and that's going to give us a negative one formal charge on that guy. We then have our carbon that is kind of triple bond on one side, single on the other, four minus zero, as there's no dots or non-bonding electrons, one half of eight uh, actually can give us a zero in this case. And lastly, here we have our triple bonded oxygen, rarely seen, but we'll do it six minus two, uh, minus one half of six for our bonding electrons. So that's gonna give us uh, six minus two, which is uh, four and minus a half of six, which is three. So that is a plus one situation uh, that basically occurred on that. Any questions on calculating those formal charges? Doing it for our double bonded guy, our second structure here. 
Uh, we'll start with our double bonded oxygen. It's going to be six minus four minus one half of our bonding, which is also four. So four non-bonding, four bonding for the lines. It's going to give us uh, basically zero. And both of these are identical, so that is zero. And then we have our double bonded carbon, which would be four minus zero non-bonding electrons minus one half of eight, uh, which is zero. So best structure here would be the double bonding, yeah. And that is what CO2 looks like. So again, uh, the usefulness of formal charge is it can, in a lot of cases, help you maybe choose between different structures. Um, you do not obviously have to calculate the formal charge unless you're asked to do so, or you don't have to uh, draw the best sort of Lewis structure uh, based on formal charge unless you're asked to do so, obviously. Um, so if you follow our rules, you actually should end up with the structure on the bottom there for CO2 um, rather than the one on top there. Any questions on formal charge or how to use it or calculate it? So talk a little bit about bond lengths. Uh, you don't have to memorize this table, but when we look at this table, these are a table of some bond lengths, the distance between two atoms in a bond. And if we look at the carbon-carbon single bond, that's 154, carbon-carbon double bond, 133, and triple bond, 120. If we look at the carbon-nitrogen single bond, it's 143 double bond 138 and triple bond 116. So what we see when we look at those measurements is every time you bring a electrons in to make another bond, everybody gets closer. Yeah, so you're bringing those electrons in, everybody gets closer. So a single bond is longer than a double bond. Double bond is longer than a triple bond. Again, because all the electrons aren't piled in between them to attract both of the nucleuses to the electrons in the middle and bringing them in. And that does relate to bond strength. Um, a triple bond is stronger than a double bond, and that is stronger than a single bond. It's not like a, a triple bond is three times as strong as a single bond or anything like that, but it's just that sort of general trend. Uh, and that obviously goes with our bond length. I think about it like when you grab a brand new pencil out of the box, you can uh, snap that thing no problem, right? After you take a couple of chemistry class exams, you got like a nubbin and an eraser left, right? And it's very hard if you wanted to try to break that thing in half. It's uh, much, much stronger to do so. Or maybe you still have a brand new pencil after the exam. I don't know what you got going on there. All right. We talked about electronegativity. Um, to, uh, these things pop back up again, I guess. Uh, but electronic TV really is what we use, as we talked about, uh, which was another thing I think that we did talk about, uh, the ability of an atom basically to bring electrons towards itself. And again, that trend increases as you go up and to the right and decreases as you go to the left and down. And the difference in electronegativity scales, as we did some calculations, I think, last time, uh, remember that you can look at the change in electronegativity. And again, if it's anywhere from zero to 0 0.4, that's considered a nonpolar bond, which is a covalent bond and considered equal sharing of electrons. If you got anything really above 0 0.4 to uh, below two, that is some type of polar covalent bond, uh, which means you have unequal sharing of electrons and remember, it is that polar bonds where we get those dipoles or bond dipoles where we could draw those arrows. And that arrow points to the more electronegative side, the more negative side of the bond. And the back end of the arrow is to the more positive side of the bond. That also creates those partially negative charges and partially positive charges that develop between the two atoms in those bonds, as I think we talked about last time. And again, they're partial charges because really... Uh, there is still some aspect of sharing that's happening with those. So the electrons have not fully transferred. And that's different than what we see with an ionic bond, right? Which is always between a metal and a non-metal. And we get a full transfer of those electrons from the metal to the non-metal. So we get a full positive charge and a full negative charge. We could also use difference in electronegativity values to help us decide ionic bond. But as we talked about, there's a lot of situations where you really don't need these numbers. 
Uh, you know that if you have a metal and a non-metal, you don't need the numbers. It's going to be an ionic bond. And some ionic bonds will have a difference less than two in terms of electronegativity, but you will always have that transfer of electrons to happen. Also, if we're comparing two elements in the same row, the one further to the right should be more electronegative, and that should create a polar bond if they are in the bond. And if we're comparing two elements in the same group on the periodic table, the one further up should be more electronegative, and that should also create a polar bond. So in a lot of cases, you can make a fairly good guess, as we talked about, in terms of electronegativity by just looking at the differences in uh, are the the general trend in electronegativity. Any questions on that? We did talk about that in here, right? Yes. Okay, I want to make sure. I feel like I, I've done it in all five of my classes this week, so I just want to make sure I'm not like, we did do that, right? Now, what we talked about, I think, as well, and just to reemphasize it, uh, when we use the difference in electronegativity, that's really what is sometimes referred to as bond polarity. And really what we're using it for in most cases is to decide whether or not the bond between those two atoms are going to be polar or nonpolar. There really is only one place where bond polarity and molecular polarity cross over. And that is again with diatomic molecules like what we see here up on the screen. And when we have diatomic molecules, especially these two here, um, that is diatomic as well, but uh, that's ionic. But when we do diatomic molecules, uh, bond polarity and molecular polarity will be the same. And as I think we might have touched upon, if we look at something like Cl2, that is going to give us a difference in electronegativity of zero, which means we would have equal sharing of electrons. It's really a pure covalent bond and a nonpolar bond. And that means that this entire molecule here, we would expect to also be nonpolar because frankly, it's only made up of one bond. So if that one bond in there is nonpolar, then the entire molecule or the molecular polarity uh, would also be nonpolar. And that's the same thing if we look at HCl here, that one bond has a difference of 0.9, which puts it as a polar bond, which means it's more negative towards the chlorine versus the hydrogen. And we could draw our bond dipole arrow pointing in that direction towards the chlorine. And once again, because this is a diatomic molecule and that's the only bond that's in that molecule, that would make that molecule also a polar molecule. And this would also turn into not just a bond dipole arrow, but what is referred to as a dipole moment. And polar molecules have dipole moments, which means there is one part of that molecule where there's really sort of a buildup of electrons and it's more negative than the other part of the molecule that's more positive. Nonpolar molecules don't have dipole moments because they have equal sharing of electrons. There is no positive or negative sign. Clearly there on the right there, we have our ionic guy. And that's what we just see here. <clears throat> we will talk more about uh, molecular polarity and dipole moments in the next chapter. It is a lot, a little bit more difficult or a little bit more things that you have to look at when you're dealing with three or more atoms and things that are not diatomic molecules. Uh, so you have to look at geometry and also the bond polarity. So there's a couple extra things you have to look at when it's not a diatomic molecule because there are multiple bonds that are sort of influencing. And there, as you can see, we definitely have dipole moment and we have an extreme dipole moment because we have electrons being transferred there in our um, ionic bond. All right, so I think we did some of those. So the next thing we wanna talk about is uh, bond energy. And although we don't talk too much about bond energy in here, uh, we will talk a little bit about it in relationship to bonding. Bond energy is sometimes referred to as delta H, and that is the enthalpy is one way to express that. And that is the heat of a reaction. And basically when we have a chemical reaction, we go from reactants to products. And basically all that happens as we go from reactants to products is we pretty much break all these bonds. And we pretty much make all those bonds. So the only thing that happens in a chemical 
reaction is really the rearrangement of those atoms and those elements. And it's really just the electrons that are involved. So there is energy associated with either making or breaking bonds. And those processes are either endothermic or exothermic. And endothermic, a reminder, is when heat and energy is absorbed. And, and exothermic is when heat and energy is released. And when we talk about delta H, if we end up with a negative value overall, uh, that is exothermic. And if we end up with a delta H value that is a positive value, that is an endothermic process. And this is sometimes referred to as bond enthalpy, which is why the delta H is involved there. So we can look up on a chart all the energy required uh, to make bonds and break bonds. And as we saw a second ago, a uh, double bond is stronger than a single bond and a triple bond is stronger than a double bond. So there is different amount of energy required to break different types of bonds, depending on what you're breaking. But the simple way to uh, sort of figure out the delta H for the reaction based on bond energy is to take uh, the delta H of all your bonds that you broke plus the delta H of all your bonds that you made. So basically you could just add them together, making sure the sign is appropriate. So if we look at a table like this here, looks something like this. So as you can see, there are different values depending on uh, the bond that you're breaking. So if you are going to do these calculations, you might want to make sure that you understand what bonds you are making and which bonds you are breaking. So sometimes a quick sketch of a Lewis structure for things helps you sort of visualize all the bonds so you don't miss bonds. So it's a very common thing. People sort of miss things. So uh, for example, if we wanted to do, uh, actually, I think we have one here. So we'll do this uh, CH4, I think. So we have CH4, like something like this. I'll put it on this page since it has the numbers. Uh, Cl2, I think. And Hc. CLH and a little HCl, I'm assuming. All right, so I think this is the example on the next slide there. <laughs> really messed up on mine, so we'll go with that. All right, so if we wanted to calculate the delta H for this reaction, we want to think about everything that we has to break. So we have to break all these bonds here. And we basically have to make all these bonds on this side. So we could just basically add up everything, sort of like an accountant, if you will. So uh, we definitely have one, two, three, and four carbon-hydrogen bonds that we need to break. So we got... In terms of breaking, four carbon-hydrogen single bonds. So we would want to find that value, which is right here. So we would take four times 414 kilojoules. We also have one chlorine-chlorine bond that we need to break. So we would find our chlorine-chlorine, and it looks like it's down here. So we got one of those chlorine-chlorine bonds which is one times 243 kilojoules. So when I break a bond, is that an endothermic process or exothermic process? When I actually break a bond, energy has to be put in, right? They gain energy and they wiggle away from each other and they break apart. So they need the energy to come in. So these are endothermic processes. So that's all the bonds that we broke, we could add them up basically. So we'll take uh, four times 414 plus uh, one times, I should probably punch it in correctly here. Huh? One times, I guess I don't need the one, 243 it would work. That uh, looks like we're gonna have a grand total of 1,899 kilojoules of energy basically needs to be put in to break those bonds. 
it is going to be a positive value because it's endothermic. On the back end here on our product side, we have made three carbon hydrogen bonds. So we can now keep track of what we're making on the other side. So on the other side here, we are going to make three of the carbon hydrogen single bonds. So that's the same energy. So three times 414. We also are gonna make one carbon chlorine bond there and that's down here. So one of the carbon chlorine bonds, which is one times 339. And lastly, we're going to make one of the hydrogen chlorine bonds, uh, which would be one times my hydrogen chlorine, which is right about there, 431, it looks like. And that is all of the bonds that we're going to make. So we're going to add all of those guys up. And that will give me three times uh, 414 plus 339, basically, plus uh, basically 431. And that's gonna give me 2012 here, kilojoules. And now these are making bonds, which is actually the opposite process. It is exothermic. So you got things wiggling around with a lot of energy. As they lose energy, they slow down so that they can then make the bonds. So these numbers really are negative. Really, all these numbers are negative through here. And we have that. So what's left to calculate is just to add those together. So our delta H of the reaction based on bond energy would be, it took 1,899 kilojoules of energy to break those bonds. It needed to release 2,012 kilojoules of energy to make those bonds. That's going to get us a net of minus 113 kilojoules of energy. This process overall in this reaction based on bond energy, is it endothermic or exothermic? It is exothermic. We have a negative value for delta H at the end. Yeah. So, slides show the... uh, it should have the same answer, I hope, but it may have a different oh, way. The same, the same answer. What they did is, it's a good question. They did, because basically what they did on the slide was uh, we broke uh, four carbon hydrogen bonds and we made three of them. So that's a net of only really one being broken. So that's what they did on the slide. And sometimes people will do that because uh, basically they cancel each other out on both sides, the three of those. And, but they should come out to the same number there as minus 113. So if you don't want to worry about misdoing it that way, you can just count up all the bonds and just do like we just did here. But that's very common as well. They'll go, well, you broke three of these and you made two of these. So that's just a net of one being broken or something like that. Yeah. Other questions? <clears throat> all right. So let's take a look at, uh, let's do another one. Let's do, um, let's do N2 plus uh, H2 makes a little NH3, a little two there, a little three there. All right, use bond energy table here, calculate the delta H for this reaction and decide is it endothermic or exothermic in this case. Okay, let's take a look. Uh, so again, I would recommend if you're not sure, uh, you maybe just guess the Lewis structure. Uh, that is a triple bond there. So you wanna make sure that you know that and you will get the right uh, bond. That's a single bond, but there also is three of them, which is the coefficient, which means you have three of these guys that you need to break. There's a two here and you would have, let's draw it down here basically two of these guys as well. So sometimes on these, uh, it is good to kind of just quickly sketch, you know, let's put all the dots or anything like that, but just quickly sketch um, the Lewis structures, just so you can visually see everything uh, that you need to break so you don't miss anything. And again, you obviously, as you can see here, you do need to take the coefficients into account as well in a balance equation. So now we need to break everything uh, over here. Uh, so we're going to break these guys. And once again, uh, in this case, we have one nitrogen, nitrogen triple bond, which looks like uh, this guy right there. So that's a 389 kilojoules. We also have 
three of the hydrogen hydrogen single bonds that we need to break. Um, so that's going to be basically three times 436 kilojoules. And that's all the breaking we're going to do there. So that's going to be uh, three times 436 uh, plus a 389. Going to give us 1,697 kilojoules. Once again, this is going to be endothermic positive values as we need that energy to go in to break them. On the making side, we got uh, one, two, three, four, five, and six. Yeah, nitrogen, hydrogen, above. What's that? It is. Thank you. I looked at I looked at the left on instead of the right. It is nine forty six. Thank you. So uh, that would also help, I guess. Look at the right number there. There. So that's going to change there. there go. So uh, it is nine forty six. So let's refix that there. That's going to be three times four thirty six plus nine forty six. So that's going to give us uh, 2254 of energy needed to break these bonds. Now we have six of the nitrogen hydrogen bonds. And I'm going to look hopefully on the right side now. Let's find that one there, right about there. I think I was just ahead of the game there, I guess. Uh, six times 389 on that side. And this is going to be exothermic as we are making bonds. So there's going to be a negative value there. So six times 389. And that's going to give us negative 2334 kilojoules. So our delta H here would be our 2254 plus our negative, or if you just subtract if you like, 2334 kilojoules. And that's going to give us minus 80 kilojoules, which once again means that overall this reaction would be exothermic as a result of the bond making and breaking here. Any questions on that there? Questions on how to calculate this? <clears throat> Clearly the table would be provided for you if you needed it, yes. <clears throat> so uh, you have another example, I think, there and again uh, i think it's worked out for you but once again in a situation like this you would also want to make sure maybe you draw it i would say probably when most people would do this if they did it from just the formula very commonly people always miss the one in the center in terms of that connection they just think about sort of the outside ones and they forget the kind of two that are connected in the center so again visually if you draw it it's sometimes very helpful so that you hopefully won't miss those. And again, I think it's here it has worked out for you. Basically what we just did there, can add up everything that we broke, uh, which in this case is one HH bond, uh, one oxygen double bond, and on the back end there, two oxygen hydrogen bonds. And again, that bond in the middle, which is the oxygen oxygen bond, which will be negative, giving us in this case, negative 136 kilojoules. Any questions on that there? All right, so we talked about resonance structures, I think, as we were kind of going through drawing Lewis structures, but resonance structures do arise when there is, you know, multiple sort of locations as to where you can make that double bond. So, for example, I think we saw it in carbonate along with some other places as well. And basically the idea behind that is one Lewis structure by itself doesn't really um, explain exactly what's going on in terms of the bonding and it's because those double bond electrons are really moving around from one atom to the next they're sort of delocalized so in the case for example of carbonate it could be on one oxygen at one point it could be on the next oxygen or it could be over there at the other oxygen so the true structure is probably a combination of any of those resonance structures that you can do resonance structures are usually separated by the that arrow that kind of heads in both directions uh, so ozone for example here is an example we could double bond here to the left we could have easily just double bonded to the right and once again those electrons sort of are moving around from one to the next so at any given time it could really kind of be bouncing around from both spots here is our carbonate example i think that we did before the charges on there are the formal charges by the way um, and again we could have that electron up on top double bonding to the left or to the right 
Benzene is an organic molecule. It has six carbons and three double bonds. Looks something like this. And each of those spots where there's a point is actually a carbon sitting at each of those spots. And basically it has three double bonds in there. And you could draw a resonance structure where the double bonds are like so. Sometimes people even draw benzene with just a circle in the middle to indicate that those electrons are kind of moving around from carbon to carbon. So you'll sometimes even see it like that. If you ever take organic, yeah. Well, you'll take real organic. So you'll probably draw it like that. Non-real organic like that. I'm just kidding. <laughs> Baby organic, so if they want to do it right. All right, uh, here's another one, but we get the idea, hopefully. A lot of resin structures coming through all the way around on this guy. All right, uh, let's finish up this chapter talking about some important things. And one of the most important things is the idea of the exception to the octet rule. So although we beat into your head, don't go over eight, don't go over eight, uh, there's going to be a lot of ones that we will go kind of over eight. But there are some exceptions to octet rule. The first one is what is referred to as an incomplete octet. And in an incomplete octet, uh, it means that you basically obviously have less than eight electrons around it. So beryllium and aluminum can do that. Uh, but really the most common probably incomplete octet that you'll come across is really boron. And boron is what is sometimes referred to as electron deficient uh, because it actually is happy and it's okay with only six electrons around it. Uh, it makes it what is known as a Lewis acid. It's able to accept electrons because it's deficient in it. Uh, but boron is probably the most common incomplete octet. It will only really need six to be okay with it, uh, like we see here in BF3. Another exception to the octet rule is an odd number of electrons. And that is uh, something where you have basically an unpaired electron. Uh, so when you add up an uh, odd number there, you will get to a electron that is by itself, sometimes referred to as free radicals. They are like, you know, unpaired electrons. Chlorine does a lot of that up in the atmosphere. They're usually very reactive because they have an unpaired electron. They don't really want to be that way. So they're very reactive sort of molecules and stuff like that. I would say out of all the exceptions, that's probably the one you see maybe the least in general chemistry procedures. Um, but it does pop up, as you see here on the nitrogen in both cases, it has an unpaired electron. Now, the one that you see probably the most, and we will talk about the most, is the expanded octet. And there are certain things that can go over eight electrons, and hence the name expanded octet could go upwards of like 12 electrons around it. Um, and that happens when you go to the periodic table and we usually like to find our friend sulfur. And we go to the right, we go to the left and we go down in the non-metal region of sulfur. And that is because sulfur is on which uh, period there? It is on the third. That means sulfur is also on what energy level? third there you go and on the third energy level that is where we first start to see what or orbitals appear the d orbitals yeah so on the third energy level there where sulfur sitting that is where we see the d orbitals start to appear which means although they're not using them they have them and they have space for the extra electrons so that is why from sulfur to the right to the left and down they have the ability to go over eight that also means when you look above sort of sulfur on the periodic table, our friend were like nitrogen, oxygen, say fluorine as well, carbon. Those guys are on period number two, which means what energy level are they on? Second, which means are there D orbitals on the second energy level? There are not, they should never ever go over eight because they have nowhere to put them. So those guys always have to obey the octet rule. Uh, but sulfur and such down can go over eight uh, if necessary to sort of continue to put electrons in there. So SF6 is an example of that. We would follow our same sort of rules here. Uh, sulfur is six. There is six times seven uh, for our valence electrons there in fluorine. 
and it's Thursday, so I'm going to grab the calculator. That's 48 electrons there. So in the center here should go sulfur. We'll have our fluorines around. And we got a couple more fluorines around. So we still actually still do the same procedure that we normally do when we draw this. We're going to do a single bond to everybody. So that's two, four, six, eight, ten, twelve electrons. We still have a bunch more to go, uh, which would be something like 36. They still go on the outside in pairs. So two, four, six, eight, ten, twelve, fourteen, sixteen, eighteen, twenty, twenty-two, twenty-four. 26, 28, 30, 32, 34, and 36. There it is. Yes, the sulfur has got uh, 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12 electrons, six bonds. It's okay. It's got those D electrons that can do that. <clears throat> Any questions on that? So I say the expanded octet is, again, something that we come across a lot. Again, you shouldn't just go expanded just for the sake of going expanded. You should probably still follow the rules we talked about in terms of drawing the Lewis structures. Uh, but some of these, if you were going to maybe look at formal charge and see what's a better structure, sometimes you can achieve a better structure by kind of going expanded octet uh, versus non-expanded octet. And as an example of that, we'll do everybody's favorite Googled answer. For Lewis structures in the previous class and maybe why your teacher knew you probably Googled it, I imagine, maybe. I don't know. But if we take our friend sulfate and there are two structures that you could come up with sulfate. You come up with the structure of sulfate, which is SO42 minus. Um, again, it has uh, six plus four times six plus two there, 24, 26, 32 electrons. And you can do your sulfur, your oxygen, your oxygen, your oxygen, oxygen. Do a single bond to each. That is two, four, six, eight, 10, 12, 14, 16, 18, 20, 22, 24, 26, uh, 28, 30, and 32. That is meeting the octet rule all the way around there, yeah. Now, maybe if you Google sul sulfate, and I'm sure nobody would do that when they're doing a, a, a worksheet or anything like that to look up the picture, you may see something drawn like so, perhaps. Maybe they put brackets around it, I don't know. That is also 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, 14, 16, 18, 20, 22, 24, 26, 28, 30, and 32. That also is all the electrons in there. That is okay in this case because sulfur is can't go that far, right? It's got two, four, six, eight, 10, 12 around it. So let's take a look at our formal charts to help us decide maybe which one is the better structure here. So if we look at our single bonded oxygen, as we did previously, it will come out the same. That's gonna be six minus six minus one half of two going to give us a negative one. So we've got a negative one for all of these oxygens. We do our sulfur there with the single bond. Going to be six minus zero minus one half of eight. Uh, that's going to be a plus two. So we do add up to minus two overall, but now we have a plus two on the sulfur, minus ones on all those. Now by double bonding on the right here, our single bonded oxygen will come out the same on the guy on the right as it did on the left. Six minus six minus one half of two is minus one. Minus one there, minus one there. We will have our double bonded oxygen, which would be six minus four. Minus one half of four is going to give us six minus four is two. Minus two is zero. So we're going to have a zero there and a zero there. And lastly, we will have our expanded sulfur happening here, which looks something like six minus zero minus one half of two, four, six, eight, 10, 12, which gives us zero as well. In this case, which one is the better structure based on formal charge? It is actually the one on the right. Yeah, We minimize the formal charge on sulfur to zero rather than plus two, which is a larger formal charge. And we also minimize the formal charge on two of the oxygens from minus one to zero as well. So this one would be really the better structure 
for sulfate based on formal charge, which is probably why you're in your Google searches, it comes up. Yes, but if you drew that for your teacher previous class, they probably wondered why you had that because they probably didn't talk about doing the expanded octet and they knew you probably looked it up, right? And drew that picture. That's why you shouldn't just draw pictures you see on the internet. You should never look on the internet. It's dangerous. Any questions on that there? <clears throat> All right, so tying that together with our formal charge. All right, here's a few uh, expanded octets. Why don't you give them a go? Why don't you draw BRF5, uh, CL, I think that's F3. And why don't you draw XEF4, I hope. Okay, let's take a look here. Uh, so we'll start here. We'll just follow our normal sort of pattern. So that's going to be seven for the bromine, five times seven there for the fluorine. That's uh, 42, I believe. In this case, uh, between bromine and fluorine, fluorine is obviously more electronegative. So the bromine should be in the middle. Again, we will attach our fluorines around. And you can lay that fifth one wherever you like. We're going to do our same sort of deal, single bond to everybody. So that is two, four, six, eight, ten electrons. Uh, we got 32 more to go. They're going to go on the outside in pairs. So that is two, four, six, eight, ten, twelve, fourteen, sixteen, eighteen, twenty, twenty-two, twenty-four, twenty-six, uh, twenty-eight. 12, 14, 16, 18, 20, 22, and 30, if I count it right there. So at this point, we have now placed basically eight times five, right? That's 40 electrons. We still have two more to go. So just like we did previously, they will go on the center atom as a pair of electrons in this case. Any questions on that? We know as well, just looking at the periodic table, we see bromine below sulfur. So it has, again, the ability to go above eight and do the expanded octet. Any questions on that one? Coming here to our guy here, that's going to be seven plus three times seven. It's going to be 28 electrons. In this case, once again, chlorine being the least electronegative in the center, we're going to do fluorine on the outside. We're going to do our single bond to each. So that is two, four, six electrons, uh, 22 more to go. So that is two, four, six, eight, 10, 12, 14, 16, 18. At this point, we have attached 24 electrons. We have four more to go. They would also, again, go on the central atom as dots. You, again, do not want to start double bonding or triple bonding until you have distributed all the electrons. Yeah, so that's how we get those dots on the central atom when we need them. Any questions on that there? Everybody's good in terms of eight. And then once again here, chlorine going above eight. And lastly here, xenon, which is our noble gas there. That's actually group eight plus four times seven. That's uh, 28 and eight, 36. Like that, uh, xenon would go in the center. By the way, electronegativity value for noble gases is zero. Yeah, they really don't want to basically do anything, so uh, they basically have no electronegativity. We'll do our fluorine around, doing our single bond here, and now that's two, four, six, eight electrons. So we've got a bunch more to go. So two, four, six. 8, 10, 12, 14, 16, 18, 20, 22, 24. At this point, we basically have 8 times 4, which is 32 electrons on there. Once again, we still have 4. And again, those will find its way to the center atom as pairs of electrons. Any questions on these? They're all expanded octets, obviously, here that we ended up with. Any questions on drawing that there? <laughs> All right, so again, obviously, I would say in our case, or in most cases, um, you should follow the rules we talked about in terms of drawing Lewis structures um, and uh, maybe not go expanded and double bind and triple bind out of the box, but uh, sometimes you need to do so, as you can see in this case. <laughs>
All right, that should wrap up, I think, this chapter here. <clears throat> All right, I think we'll lay it up for now.